Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Aaron. If we've not met, I would love to chat with you after the service. It's my joy to get to bring God's word today, even though this passage is 22 verses. And uh, it's always a challenge for the preacher when you have 20 minutes to preach on 22 verses. It's like having five children and two parents and you're outnumbered. Uh, I feel that way about the the challenge of the passage today. But I think that there are incredible things to be found in this story, this collection of things that Jesus did and things that Jesus taught. And if you weren't here last week, we started last week a series in Mark that is focused on the beginning of the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus declares in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he comes and he preaches his first message after he's baptized. And what he says is kind of interesting. It's kind of puzzling to us because usually we think that the message of Christianity is your sins can be forgiven or Jesus died for you so you don't have eternal punishment to fear or something like that. But what Jesus actually says is, I declare to you the good news that the kingdom of God is near. And then he says, repent and believe or turn, change your life and now believe this good news. Believe that the kingdom of God is near. And then now in chapter two of Mark, we begin to see what happens when the kingdom of God comes to earth. When earth that is in disarray from sin and rebellion against God begins to experience God entering into the story again and working in power to set broken things right. That's what we see in Mark chapter 2. And this remarkable story about a man who has been paralyzed and he's lowered through a hole in the ceiling by his friends to get in front of Jesus. Anyone ever been cut in line before? I imagine how, you, how the people felt who had lined up at the door and they've waited their turn for their miracle and it's been this huge hubbub because Jesus is healing people and everybody wants in and you think you're almost there and then a dude floats down from the ceiling and he gets all the attention and he's still in the Bible and 2,000 years later we're talking about him, I would be salty. I would have a hard time being a good Jewish boy and following the rules, I'd be yelling at people, right? Jesus, didn't you see? Anyway, this is a fascinating story, isn't it? And Jesus comes and he does all of these miracles and he he acts, he enacts, he shows the, the coming of the kingdom in powerful ways. But I think that this can actually cause modern day Christians and modern day skeptics some trouble. And I wonder if anybody here has ever had this question or some version of this question before. I remember hearing it a lot from teenagers when I used to work in youth ministry. And that was some version of the question, how come it seems like God was constantly doing miracles and amazing things in the Bible and it doesn't seem like that today? Anybody ever wondered or asked some version of that question? It's fine. You can put your hand up. I felt that way. Oh, not that many of you. Or you're lying. I don't know. Okay, there... Well, as I've wrestled with that, one of the things that a a fellow preacher said to me one time as I was talking with them about how do we help train up congregations to have eyes to see what God's doing, and one of the insights that he gave uh, shaped what I want to share with you today out of Mark chapter 2, and he said, we need to help modern Christians have the eyes to see the Holy Spirit's work in all the ways the Bible describes it. Sometimes we think God's only at work when it's like out of heaven, a voice from on high, or like nobody does anything and suddenly somebody's better or a situation gets fixed. But what we see in scripture, just like we saw in this story, is that God is constantly working in lots of ways. The Holy Spirit is at work today in this room, in this body of Christ, in powerful ways. And there would be story after story of how God is delivering us from physical, spiritual, emotional, mental diseases and and struggles, financial struggles, situational struggles. We could share story after story and you'd be like, wow, God is powerfully at work. But we sometimes lack the eyes to see all the ways God is working. The way his kingdom is still breaking into our sinful world today, just like it was back then. So my hope today is to help answer that question, to help you have eyes to see both in the text and in our lives together today as a body of Christ, how the kingdom continues to break into the world and how God chooses to work to bring his kingdom now in part and someday in full. So I'd love for you to flip in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2 if you haven't already. That's page 813 in your pew Bible. If you want to open up to there, you can pull it up on your phone. It's also in your journal. So if you want to just open your journal, I'm going to give you some notes today, some things for you to kind of file away in your brain and be reflecting on. 
Um, I think that these could be lenses, framework with which you can read the rest of the book of Mark, but also framework you can use for understanding how God is at work in your life, in your family's life, in your small group, and here in this community at Mel Run. So let me give you the big idea for today, and that's this, that when the kingdom breaks in, the curse is reversed. Now that last part rhymes a little bit, so maybe you can try to remember that. When the kingdom breaks in, the curse is reversed. If you haven't spent a ton of time in scripture, you might not know what I mean by the curse. You have to kind of, in your mind, go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 1 through 3, we read about the creation of the world, the creation of the first people, and they are living in perfect harmony with one another, with themselves, with nature, and with their God. And then they choose rebellion over obedience. They choose to not do what God has called them to do. And it's this perfect picture of how sin not only makes us guilty before the Lord, but it just wrecks the perfect creation God had made and the life he intends for us to live. I read one author said it's something like a perfect boat. If you imagine in your head a perfect ship, it is designed to float on water, right? And if it's on water and the winds are, are steady and everything is kind of in perfect conditions, there is nothing wrong with that boat. Everything works just like it's supposed to work. But the second that boat runs to ground, suddenly everything about that boat is wrong because it's not meant to crash into the ground, it's meant to sail at sea. Well, so it is with creation, so it is with you and I, so it is with nature, so it is with world history. It was meant to live in perfect harmony, in obedience to the Lord, and in the second we rebelled, the second sin enters the picture, it's like that ship that's run aground, and now every part of creation, every part of life has been touched, has been shattered by sin. And the Bible talks about that as the curse. God announces this curse as they have committed sin in the garden and tells them now you're uh, having children in your family life, your relationships will be violently disrupted. Now your work life will be difficult, it will be filled with toil. Now you will face sickness and death. And we see in the very first moment where they're confronted, where Adam and Eve are confronted with the curse, their relationship with one another and with nature also is shattered. All of those relationships, all that harmony that was created in Eden runs aground on disobedience and rebellion. And so when the kingdom comes, even that kingdom language is important, when God becomes king again, when he rules and he reigns, in the place where that happens, in the heart where that happens, in communities where that happens, the curse is reversed. Like the ship is getting repaired and sent back out to sea. You with me so far? Does that make sense? So what we're going to see all through the, the gospel of Mark is not just declarations about the kingdom, but demonstrations of the kingdom. A picture of what it looks like when God is breaking into the world. And what's cool to me is that it's not just all unexplainable, miraculous things from on high. It actually looks a lot like what our life together as Christians looks like when we are living in obedience and seeking after the Lord. So let me give you four ways we see that. Four different insights from the text about what happens when the kingdom breaks in. Of what it looks like when the curse is reversed. And these are the ones I'd love you to write down. The first one is animosity becomes community. Animosity becomes community. I alluded to this already, but I, I love the moment when God shows up in the garden and he confronts Adam and Eve after they've eaten the fruit they're not supposed to eat. And do you know what they start doing immediately? blaming everybody, right? Eve says, the snake told me to do it. And then God turns to Adam, and Adam's like, I don't know, the woman. And then he, even more, aud more audacious than that, says to God. He says to the God of the universe, the woman that you put here, like this is when, I do this with my wife sometimes just as a joke, like guess what your son did today, right? I, I've absolved myself of all responsibility. Um, that's what Adam tries to do. So Eve blames nature, Adam blames the woman, they both blame God, everybody's blaming everybody. And then the first story we read after that is Cain and Abel, the first murder in the Bible. And the story just becomes, as the Bible continues, animosity, 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 people fighting and competing, cheating one another, uh, all kinds of ways in which animosity rules and reigns when sin rules and reigns, right? And then what we see in this story is a really powerful picture of community. 
And we see this throughout the book of Mark. I'm just drawing this out of this one example, but you can keep looking for the way that people are brought together. I think the most obvious way you see this in the New Testament is the book of Romans. When Jews and Gentiles who had lived in animosity, not unlike what we're seeing in the Middle East right now between Palestine and Israel, come together into one body and they learn, Jews and Gentile Christians learn to live together in peace and in harmony. When the kingdom breaks in, animosity turns and it becomes community. And I think we see this represented well in those friends who show up and they carry their friend up onto the roof somehow. I don't, I don't know how they got him up there. It would be pretty entertaining probably to have watched this try to happen. And then they dig through some person's roof. I don't know what the home insurance situation was in first century uh, Near East days, but they dig through the roof and they lower the man down on the mat. Now, has anyone ever, if you've read this story before, maybe just as you heard it today, thought, I wish I had four friends like that. Uh, Teenagers, kids in the room, what they don't tell you is that making friends as adults is really hard. It feels like speed dating or something. It's weird, right? To have good, close friends, especially if you've moved or something, like if you're not still where you grew up, it can be challenging. And a lot of us can feel like wow, I don't know if I have four friends who would haul me up on a roof, dig some guy's roof open and lower me in front of Jesus. But here's what I want to tell you today. You were brought into the presence of God today. You were lowered into Jesus' presence today in worship by a whole bunch of people who dug a hole and made it possible for you to enter in. Just this morning, we had people call in sick from the worship team, and so Joe had to do a a Phil Collins on the drums, and he was playing drums and singing and trying to make it work, right? And Bryce had to come up with a new service order this morning. We had people you never saw this morning downstairs making Rally Sunday happen so that at least one time a month, you parents in the room aren't having to spend the whole sermon going, shh, shh, stop, shh, stop, right? All of that so that you can enter into the presence of God. We had people making coffee and opening up the front doors. We had people even that who aren't here part of us who wrote the songs that we sang. I mean, the biblical David wrote the psalm that you said out loud today. All of these different hands, all these different people that God used, the community God used to make it possible for you to be here in his presence today. That is the picture of the body of Christ at work. We don't always see it, We don't always think to be thankful to God for it, but God is constantly at work bringing the kingdom by having people who aren't paid to do it, who don't have any reason to do it other than they feel called by God and they love you, show up every week, hundreds of them, to just make what happens here at this church possible. Now imagine the church around the world, how many different people God is calling and using to dig a hole in the roof so that people who need his presence can be lowered into it. Do you see it? Your small group is a perfect example of this. Dan's invitation to you is, is so important. And that's why if you don't have it, like, and, and the struggle to find community in a new church if you're new here, or the struggle to make friends if you've recently moved, small groups is meant to solve for this because we need community. It is not just helpful. It is a picture of the kingdom of God breaking in and reversing the curse of animosity and isolation that would leave us feeling alone and angry and at odds with one another. And now we get to be part of what God is doing to build us together as his body. Amen? Amen. The second thing we see when the kingdom breaks in is that wounding becomes healing. Wounding becomes healing. Now, we obviously see this in the story of the paralyzed man who hears first that his sins are forgiven. We'll talk about that at the end. But then he also is told, get up and walk. And Jesus is showing in power what he is capable of. The healing stories in the Bible aren't just cool. It's not just like, wow, God loves us, so he heals us. Because if we think about it that way, sometimes we can think to ourselves, well, I prayed for healing for myself or for my grandma or for whoever, and they didn't receive it. Does God really love me? That's the wrong framework to understand the miracles, the healings that Jesus does. It tells us right in the text, the people start to question, how can this man forgive sin? And Jesus says, well, what's easier, to say you're forgiven, which is pretty easy, or to tell a man who's been paralyzed for years, get up and walk and have it happen. You see, the miracles, the healings are not the end in themselves. They're not the most important thing God does. They're a sign. They're a means to an end. It is showing, Jesus is showing them, look, I have the power and authority to declare these other things that you wouldn't believe if I didn't show you something awesome. They should have been gasping and celebrating when he told a sinner that their sins were forgiven, but they don't. 
They only are amazed when he tells a paralyzed man, get up and walk. And Jesus connects the dots between healing and forgiveness again when he has dinner with the tax collectors and the Pharisees. Oh, I'm sorry, the tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees come and they say, how can you eat dinner with sinners? That was a big no-no in this day. Who you fellowshiped with at the table was how your social status and even your spiritual status was sometimes understood. And Jesus said to them, I haven't come for the well, but for the sick. The sick are the ones that need a healer. The sick are the ones that need a hospital. But Jesus hasn't actually healed anybody physically in this story, but he's showing how when the kingdom breaks in, when Jesus gets a hold of people, he heals them, but not just of the most obvious things like paralyzed legs that become walking legs. He heals communities that are in animosity and turns them into communities that serve and love one another. He heals people in heart and spirit and mind and soul. The curse is reversed because this ship that has run aground, right, the ship of our lives that runs up against the rocks of sin, it doesn't just impact our eternal destiny. It doesn't just impact our physical bodies. It touches and it breaks every part, every facet of our humanity and of our life together and even of creation itself. And so Jesus comes to bring healing. Wounding becomes healing when the kingdom of God breaks in. And we do see signs and wonders, even still today. I'm curious if anybody would be willing to raise their hand. Has anybody ever seen or experienced in their own life a time where you'd say, you know what, I had a problem and God was the one that delivered me from it? Physical, spiritual, financial, look around the room. God still does this, friends. And let me just briefly give some theological insight here. There's churches, sometimes I think they can get this wrong in two ways. There are some churches where I've experienced that become too focused on the healing and the awesome, supernatural, unexplainable stuff and kind of forget that that's a sign that points to something else. And it's like getting my healing, getting my breakthrough, getting my financial deliverance is the point, and that is not the point of our faith. But God uses those moments to encourage our faith so that we'll believe the harder things that he says to us about eternal destiny and sin and that kind of thing. And then there's other churches that are like, let's just forget about all that supernatural stuff. And let's just talk about sin and forgiveness. God isn't in the healing business anymore. He's not in the miracle business anymore. And I don't think you see any evidence of that here in the scriptures either, especially because miracles and signs and wonders and provision are ways that God reminds us, shows us that he is powerful enough for the audacious claim of heaven and restoration of all things to actually be true. Right, do you see that? Holding together healing and forgiveness makes both more powerful and awesome in our lives. God is still in this business. When the kingdom breaks in, wounding becomes healing. The third one is that mourning becomes rejoicing. Mourning becomes rejoicing. Jesus is with his disciples and they're supposed to be fasting on particular days, in particular situations. And again, Jesus is questioned about this by people who think like, aha, finally, we got you, Jesus. You're not a real teacher. Why aren't your disciples fasting? And he says to them, well, the, the groomsmen don't fast when the groom is in their presence. When the groom is there and they're getting ready for the wedding and they're, they're getting ready for the feast and the celebration, that's a joyful time. He's saying to them, the kingdom is breaking in. This is not a time for sack, sackcloth and ashes. Not a time for tearing our garments and weeping. It's a time for rejoicing. And then he does say, and this is important, he does say that there will come a time again when Jesus will be taken away from them. And that kind of powerful, full experience of the kingdom of God will, will be taken away. And now we live in this world where like we've got one foot in the kingdom of God, and yet still the world is broken, still our lives are shattered, still we wrestle with sin. And so there is a place for mourning, for grieving, for repentance in our lives. But Jesus shows that in the places and times where God breaks into history and in the world to come, Revelation 21 tells us there'll be no more tears and no more sadness. Where the kingdom of God breaks in, he says, where we experience God's work in our lives, our mourning and our sadness and our hopelessness are replaced with joy. And then lastly, the rule of sin becomes the gift of grace. The rule of sin becomes the gift of grace. And I just want to sit on this one for a minute. Revisit what happens when that paralyzed man is lowered from the ceiling and I'm three people back going, hey, you cheated. And Jesus turns to him and, and what does he say? He doesn't right away say, get up and take your mat and walk. What does he offer him first? Your sins are forgiven. 
And we give the Pharisees a hard time often, right? But here's a place where the Pharisees get something right that we get wrong. The Pharisees are not shocked when Jesus heals paralyzed people. They are outraged when he dares to declare, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because the Pharisees actually had a rightly big view of sin and then what a big deal it was for God to forgive. The people around, the the crowds, they're amazed when the, the miraculous healing of the legs happens. But the Pharisees know, you can't just go off saying you forgive sin. That's blasphemy. Only God can do that. Only God can declare this. And then Jesus proves, he demonstrates his power that he is God in the flesh. And he silences the Pharisees' objection. But I wonder if if we see the miracle of forgiveness for all that it is. We every week come together and we pray a prayer of confession. And then every week, those of us who get to stand up here get to declare the good news. We get to say to you the exact same thing Jesus said to that man on that mat 2,000 years ago. And the same miracle takes place. The God of the universe who should hold us to account for the way we have shipwrecked creation, for the way we have rebelled against him, for the way we have run our lives aground on the rocks of sin. That God should stand over us and condemn us and wipe us out and start again with people who would actually listen and obey and use our lives the way he told us to. But instead, what he does is he forgives our sins. And so if you have been feeling that feeling of why don't I see God at work in power the way I usually see it in the Bible, know this, you see it every single week. You see it every single week when you come here and you confess to the God of the universe who could and maybe even should hold you accountable for your rebellion and instead he turns to you in mercy and grace and offers you forgiveness and heals what is broken and turns animosity to community, delivers you from all of the ways that you are destroyed by sin, and because of that, our mourning turns to rejoicing. And so I just want to end today with an invitation to us to sit for a moment, to to have a big enough view of sin, but not not to walk out of here like, if you leave and like, oh, I just got to be more worried about sin, you've missed what I'm saying. What I want you to see is the bigness of sin so that you appreciate the miraculousness of God's forgiveness and all that Jesus did, all that he came to offer to you. And in just a moment, when I declare these words to you from Scripture about the forgiveness of your sins, know that you are receiving a miracle greater than the changing of paralyzed legs into walking legs because that man went on to live a life and then entered into a tomb and his greatest hope was not in the deliverance of paralyzed legs into walking legs, but from death to life, from condemnation to salvation. Do you see it? And we get that miracle today. And so let's just take a moment to sit together in quiet reflection on our own sin of the last week, our own struggle to be obedient to God the way Adam and Eve were struggling to be obedient, the old, our own ways in which we've shipwrecked up against the rocks of sin, but also just get a bigger picture. Take a moment to reflect on the big picture of how thoroughly sin has wrecked all that God created, all the ways that the curse has been part of our lives, and how beautiful it is that the curse is reversed because of what Jesus has done. Let's sit with that together, and then we'll pray confession and hear the words of forgiveness. I'd encourage you to sit or kneel, whatever